you raise your right hand, please? You solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to so help you, God. Please be seated. <coughs> we very much appreciate your coming, gentlemen. I want to apologize to you for the lateness of the hour. Uh, for the record, uh, obviously, you are appearing on a voluntary basis, and we are grateful for your cooperation. Um, we will begin with you, Mr. Udaley. Uh, if you have any prepared statement, we would be delighted to hear that, and then we have some questions to ask of you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, gentlemen of the committee. I do not have a prepared statement. Uh... Okay, for the record, would you state your history of, uh, of involvement with HUD? Yes, sir. My name is Dick Udaley. I served as the regional administrator of HUD in Fort Worth, Texas, Region 6, from February of 1982 until May of 1984. I served as a non-career senior executive. And what have you been doing since 84, sir? I had been in the real estate business in Fort Worth since 1969. I returned to my own business when I left HUD in 84. Very good. <clears throat> now, I understand you told subcommittee investigators that in your capacity as regional administrator of the Fort Worth HUD office uh, between 82 and 84, you met with uh, Lance Wilson to discuss the UDAG application urban development action grant application for the Riga Ridge project in Fort Worth. And that Mr. W Wilson told you, and I'm quoting, your regional recommendation of disapproval is making it very difficult to bring that application to fruition. Is that an accurate statement, sir? Yes, sir, that is. Can you tell us a little bit about your discussion with Mr. Wilson on that subject? Okay, yes, sir. Just by, by way of background, Please. The, uh, in, I believe in 1982, an application had been made by, through the city of Fort Worth for the UDAG grant in an amount of $7 million for the Regal Ridge development, which was to be an approximately 800-unit multifamily development in Fort Worth. As part of the HUD process, the then area offices followed by the regional offices. You've heard testimony earlier today how the two were later combined into one office. At that time, there were two offices. Would each weigh and measure and investigate the various aspects of the UDAG grant as they applied to the HUD criteria? Uh, this was a rather routine procedure. Then the grant would come through the regional office, or the grant request, to come on up to the central office in Washington for final shaping up, negotiating terms, and then going in for uh, recommendation to the uh, secretary's office. In this particular situation, every one of our various program areas could not find a reason to recommend the grant. It just did not seem to fit any of the different criteria that applied to it. Therefore, it had a recommendation of disapproval by the area office. It had recommendations of disapproval by the regional office. It is my understanding that the regular career HUD UDAG staff in the central office also were recommending disapproval on this. Uh, but this particular project seemed to just kind of keep coming back. You've also heard testimony on several occasions today how word can come, perhaps informally, but that uh, in HUD terminology, the tenth floor, which is HUD talk for the secretary's office, has a special interest in this project. And that is what we were picking up was that the tenth floor was especially interested in this project. There was a extreme amount of pressure being brought to bear on the staff from central office all the way through Dallas with regard to this particular project. Uh, with Can these you describe the form that extreme pressure took? Okay, we had city staff that, uh, yes, under normal circumstances, would and should be aggressive in pursuing a UDAG. It was a limited amount of federal money, this was a free gift to the city, and so, yes, they were being diligent,
but there's a point at which one becomes almost overly aggressive. Uh, different people would receive phone calls or you'd be or you'd have people come up and tell you I sure hope y'all can get this one through during my approximate two and a half years with the agency we probably handled dozens perhaps hundreds of UDAG applications from the five state area that I supervised and rarely in no other case did we get this many calls and expressions of interest regarding a particular UDAG. So in late March of 83, the, all of the HUD regional administrators were in Washington for a routine training series where we would meet with the various program assistant secretaries and they would keep us informed of any changes that were going on and we in turn could inform them of any problems that we were experiencing in the field implementing the programs. It was during this meeting that uh, I requested a meeting with uh, Mr. Wilson and the two of us met uh, privately in his office at the HUD building during the last week of March of 1983. Uh, it was almost like deja vu this morning to uh, hear his testimony he obviously wasn't on oath. He obviously outranked me, so I could not say, you know, you will do this. But uh, as far as getting anything substantive from him, I was just saying, please tell me, please give me one reason why this UDAG is of importance. Please tell me why this should be going through. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, there might be a reason that one is not aware of why something should happen that is known to people you know, up the chain from them. And basically, all I got was there are people that are interested in this, uh, and also that I was told that the report that our various personnel people, or not personnel, but program people, had put together in which they had evaluated all the aspects, held it up, he said, this has made it very difficult for us. Uh, the next week, they then cut the request in half and granted a three and a half million dollar urban development action grant to the Regal Ridge project for approximately 400 units then some months subsequent to that turned around and made a second three and a half million dollar grant thus in effect making the entire seven million dollar grant. Was it your impression that they split the grant into two parts to uh, sort of try to slip it through? on a more reduced basis, or what was the basis for splitting it? If I recall correctly, sir, one of the objections that the various staff members raised was that this particular developer had never had experience with a project of this size. In addition to, I believe, the developer had no or very little funding of his own in it. It did not meet the impaction criteria. Uh, we were perhaps not needing that many units in Fort Worth at that time for a multitude of reasons. Therefore, by coming in in half, they thought perhaps this would belay or calm some of these uh, objections that had been raised. Now, subsequent events uh, justified your disapproval and opposition, did they not, uh, Mr. Udale? Yes, sir, they have. Could you tell us what happened to the project? the best of my knowledge, the project is currently posted for foreclosure. Texas has a uh, trust deed, is a trust deed state, so you don't have a judicial foreclosure. Uh, I believe Mr. Briscoe was able to get a uh, temporary restraining order that kept it from being foreclosed in September, so I think it's up for either an October or a November foreclosure. Uh, the project is several hundred thousand dollars in arrears in its payment of city taxes, which is one of the reasons for the UDAG program is to enhance the tax base. Of course. Uh, the project, I, you know, I, I have not personally inspected or anything. I can't speak to its, per, to its condition, but uh, I do know that financially it is in a very, in a real shambles. Did you feel that Mr. Wilson had a particular personal interest in pushing it? This was the general feeling within the agency. Uh, Mr. Wilson is a very canny, shrewd, intelligent 
capable individual and would not say or do anything that in any way would directly tie him to it. But it definitely seemed to have the, the entire blessing of at least Mr. Wilson, if not the Secretary's office. When you left Mr. Wilson's office on that occasion, when uh, you asked him to give you some reason why you should approve it, uh, how did you leave matters as you walked out of that office? Uh, I could give you a corny Texas answer and say it doesn't I, I take... I buy a corny Texas answer. You say it doesn't take me long to look at a hot horseshoe. Okay. And, when, you know, I knew the deal was happening, and there wasn't anything I could do about it other than wait for this opportunity. I understand, uh, for you, Daly, that you told subcommittee investigators, I believe I'm quoting you, that Wilson was the brains behind Dean. Yes, sir. Would you care to elaborate on that? Yes, what sir. What you meant by that and why you felt that way. Okay, yes, sir. Uh, I think in the early days of the Reagan administration, there's quite, a, there's quite a post mortem going on on the early days of the Reagan administration with regard to HUD and with regard to the backgrounds and the abilities of many of the uh, appointees that came on board in those early days. Uh, there were a few of us who came from the real estate industry. Yes. Many of them did not. I was perhaps one of the few with the amount of real estate background, and particularly multifamily background, that, that had come on. Uh, we soon discovered that you had a few people that, uh, to quote George or Orwell, were more equal than others and that you had a few people who could uh, make things happen and a lot of people who couldn't in headquarters. And one of these obviously was uh, Mr. Wilson. Another one uh, was Miss Dean. And she depended on him for a lot of her instruction. Uh, at the time when I was serving, I believe she served in the executive office of the secretary uh, jokingly, folks referred to her as the keeper of the auto pen. And she, you know, could make letters come out that uh, helped make a case or that hurt a case, just depending on how she felt about them. Uh, the two enjoyed a rather close personal relationship. I believe this has been mentioned in many of the various newspapers. Uh, you know, they... There's professional conduct in public, and then there's conduct that uh, belies a more than professional involvement with each other, and this would be apparent in their involvements with each other. Mrs. Dean, Miss Dean, to my knowledge, had very little, if any, real estate experience. Uh, Mr. Wilson left and left in his place someone who was thus effectively able to channel many, many projects in his direction. I believe at that point y'all are much more knowledgeable of that than I am. You also said, and I'm quoting, she stayed there as his foil. Mm -hmm. Would you care to expand on that? Yes, sir. If you have the decision making for anything down into very few people, if you have direct access to those people, and then if you receive the vast bulk of the benefit of what those people are able to pass out, that is what, you know, I, I can't say I sat in a strategy meeting where that was planned, but you could, again, to quote Mr. You know, or to paraphrase Mr. Naclerio, you could feel it happening. And again, subsequent events, I believe, have borne that out. Now, you do know, sir, that Mr. Wilson had a substantial equity interest in several Section 8, 8 mod rehab projects awarded to the Wynn Group of Denver. Yes, sir. Under the Section 8 mod rehab program from 1985 to 1988, 
the Wynn Group, uh, were awarded 1,347 mod rehab units with $133.6 million in budget authority, $29 million in tax credits. Based on your personal knowledge, do you believe Ms. Dean was influenced by Mr. Wilson or by her relationship with Mr. Wilson in her participation in the awarding of Section 8 Mod Rehab funds? I left the agency in 1984. Yes, I know. I have never been a HUD developer before I came with the agency or after I left the agency. So I have not had direct close contact with the agency. I have several people whom I came to know while I was with the agency that I maintain contact with once or twice a year and on occasion when I'd be talking to some of these people, some of them who were still with the agency, they were expressing how they were very disturbed and ill at ease with some of the allocations or fundings or the awardings of the various projects and especially with uh, what Miss Dean was doing and uh, also I believe I would heard the name I've never met the gentleman Hunter Cushing but that name was mentioned also so my answer would have to be more or less uh, second guessing I have no intimate first-hand knowledge but that yes that was happening I know a experience I did have I was in El Paso Texas in February of 88 uh, at a meeting and called on a real estate broker friend of mine out there and was telling him about a property that my company was managing in the Fort Worth area. This was a property that had been foreclosed and was owned 50% uh, by the FDIC and 50% by uh, Texas Savings and Loan. Could you pull the mic a little <clears throat> closer? Certainly. Thank you, sir. Okay. And explaining to this gentleman how the property could be bought for a very cheap price but needed quite a bit of rehab work. He said, let me call another fella. He called another broker who contacted me and he said, I've been selling properties to a group of folks out of Colorado that have access to some kind of government money. Please send me some particulars on the property. I think this would be something they would be interested in. We never particularly got beyond that point, but this, I said, oh, would this be Phil Wynn and Phil Abrams, and he said, how do you know about them? I said, I used to work with them. So it was a well-known thing within the real estate industry that they were actively looking for projects of that type, sir. You indicated a minute ago a close relationship between Mr. Wilson and Miss Dean. Would you care to expand on that? Yes, sir. When we would come in for training, Many times we would, uh, the 10 regional administrators and as many of the headquarters staff as possible would go out for dinner after hours and give us a chance to continue visiting and, and so on. And Miss Dean would normally sit next to Mr. Wilson. Just the body language between the two was quite different than the body language between two professionals who happened to be sitting next to each other at a dinner party. Congressman Shays. Well, I'm, I just... <laughs> <laughs> For the purposes of a hearing, um, I don't know what body language means, and I'm not an expert on body language. It, are you saying that um, Deborah Gordine and Lance Wilson had a close uh, relationship expressed how? Touches sitting a little too close to each other, looks in one's eyes, just references, slight innuendos. Okay. That's the extent of it? That's the extent that I can testify to, sir. Uh, okay. Now, I never followed them home. <laughs> no, well, I just then, I don't, really don't know if that's all that relevant, very honestly. Okay. I mean, did you ever uh, see them um, uh, express anything more? Did you ever see them any public uh, uh, areas, uh, restaurants or anything together? Um, no, sir. When I was in Washington, I was generally, I was here on business and was generally working the whole time. Um, so I'll just tell you that I, I just 
I just don't know. Uh, in your judgment, I guess the bottom line is you felt that they had a, a more personal relationship than, than uh, one usually has in a, in a professional environment, and that's basically what I'm left with. Yes, sir. I believe that was a feeling within the agency. Okay. Um, you, have, um, you have said something that I think is uh, quite significant, and that is that you have uh, definitely uh, linked Lance Wilson to a project uh, and to a development in which the grassroots of the organization wanted nothing to do with it. They didn't think it was a good project, including yourself. Um, and um, you're telling us that in meeting with Lance Wilson, he never attempted to justify on, on e economic grounds or any other grounds why this project should be funded? No, sir. Did he uh, ever say that so-and-so wanted a political figure wanted it? Did he ever try to, 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 to justify it on political grounds? I was hoping he'd say something. Did he ever try to, the answer is no? The answer is no, sir. Did he ever try to justify it by saying that the secretary wants this project funded? I really wanted him to say something like that. He just kind okay. of gave me the same evasive answers he gave you, sir. That bad? Worse, sir. Okay. You got off light, sir. Okay. I worked for him. Yeah. Um, so what I hear you saying is basically he said he wanted the project funded and that should be good enough for you. He, he never even said he wanted it funded. He just it was kind of like it was going to happen. Um, did, you ever did you ever say I'm not going to fund this project or this project will be funded over my dead body or anything like that? Well, I probably animated over my dead body, and uh, I paid it quite a toll for having made those kind of statements. But, How do you uh, think you paid the toll? Uh, same way you can make life uncomfortable for any subordinate if you choose to, sir. Okay. But uh, I did not have the authority to fund the project or to stop it from being funded. You didn't have to sign off on anything? We had signed off recommending disapproval, sir. The actual approval so you, process for a UDAG was done or <clears throat> in this period in time to the best of my recollection was done through the office of the assistant secretary for community planning and development who took the group of technically fundable UDAGs that were eligible to be funded in that particular funding round and this is what all the regional administrators were told that this then went into secretary Pierce's office and that he secretary Pierce then decided which ones to fund, which ones not to. And this was a decision that was way beyond my scope of authority or beyond my position, sir. So I was making the last minute appeal to the highest level official that I could get access with to say, I, this does not make sense to any of our people. Whatever the reasons are, please don't do it. Now, and that, and that was declined. And that highest ranking official uh, was Lance Wilson? Yes, sir. I had met previously with Bollinger. I could not get access to Mr. Pierce. Okay. Mr. Pierce would not meet with you? That's correct, sir. And I just want to be very clear. Y your uh, regional uh, office recommended this project not be funded, and you were making it emphatic that yes, that was the case, and that you pleaded with him not to have this project funded. And his basic response was, this project's getting funded. Yes, sir. Okay. And he never attempted to justify it, tell no, you why, or anything else. No, now, sir. Now, Mr. Chairman, I just want to be clear on this. Is this a development, uh, a development, uh, is the developer of this particular development uh, the individual who gave Lance Wilson uh, equity interest in a project? But That's correct. Mr. Briscoe. That's yes. Leonard Briscoe. But it's not, Briscoe. he got equity in a project, a different project than Mr. Briscoe. Uh, two years later. That's okay. correct. Um, well, you know, of all the things we've heard today, uh, and there's been a lot of interest in other comments, I think your comments are, are frankly, um, the most significant um, and bear out looking into. Uh, and um, what you're saying, in essence, is a HUD official uh, promoted a project against the advice of all other HUD officials that you're aware of, uh, and then after leaving HUD, ended up with a financial interest with a developer who he happened to have benefited. Yes, sir. And yes. Uh, that's quite a statement.
That's correct. Has any uh, anyone from Justice interviewed you yet? Uh, have you been interviewed on this issue? No, sir. Have you been, has anyone contacted you about what you said in the newspaper and, and what you're saying, uh, the general issue of today? Not, not other than your committee staff and uh, several newspapers, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If I may turn to you, Mr. Sevier. Uh, do you have an opening statement, sir? If so, we'll be very pleased to hear it. No, sir, I don't. Then we'd like to go to questions. Uh, uh, let me first uh, deal with the Regal Reach project in Fort Worth. Could you tell us uh, what your appraisal of that project was? Well, as I recall, both the Dallas office... Could you pull it a bit closer, please? Yes. Actually, the technical staff in the Fort Worth office, as well as Dallas, recommended disapproval of the project. Uh, these reasons basically ranged from uh, lack of a market or a need for the project to the fact that it would further impact racially and economically a low-income area. There were also other questions such as limited job creation, uh, low leveraging of uh, private money and I think a limited equity on the part of the developer. But as it's already been stated, the technical staff uh, did recommend disapproval. Was that, a, as far as you recall, um, a unanimous recommendation of the technical staff? It or was. It yes. was a unanimous recommendation of the technical staff? Of all the different disciplines, yes, sir. Why, in your judgment, was the project finally funded? I really don't know. I, I did not have the, uh, the contact with Washington as Mr. Udaley did at the time. It was, it was obviously funded by Washington, signed off uh, by Secretary Pierce on the 800 units. Uh, the only footnote I could add to that would be that uh, I believe in Region 6, uh, we have had approved about 150 or 153 UDAX. Uh, this was the only one to my memory that was approved without a strong recommendation from the field office. That's a remarkable, uh, that's a remarkable piece of evidence and testimony and uh, and it leads me to, to, to asking the obvious question. On the, how long have you been with HUD, Ms. Sevier? I came with uh, FHA and HUD in 1964. So you have a quarter century, basically, yes. 25 years. Uh, would it be fair to say that uh, uh, this was an egregious example of political interference and the overruling of the technical and professional career staff? Well, it was, it was obviously a difference or an overruling of the technical staff, uh, which, you know, occasionally happens in program areas where Washington has the final decision. Uh, like I say, as far as the UDAG program, this is the only instance I recall of Washington basically approving a project that we had recommended disapproval. But it, it does happen in program areas occasionally. What is your appraisal of the current status of the project? Well, the, the project uh, basically, I guess, would have to be termed a failure. A it, failure. It's obviously in the process of foreclosure. Physically, uh, the project is in pretty good shape. Mr. Udaley says that financially, obviously, it's a disaster. Um. Please. Um, before we go off this, uh, I'd love to be able to ask both of uh, I'd be very happy to yield to my friend. Um, I don't usually do this, but um, Lance Wilson issued a press release, a supplemental statement today. I'm going to read it to you, and I'm going to have both of you comment on it. No, excuse me, September 27th. This is today, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs>
morning. <laughs> Said Lance Wilson, while at HUD, had no authority to award UDAG grants. The awarding of such grants is determined via a process that is highly structured and institutionalized, not informal or premised on vague criteria. First, cities or counties must formally apply to HUD on behalf of a particular project. Then an extensive review is undertaken by the UDAG office of HUD, which ultimately issues a list of projects in proprietary order, propriety order that are recommended to receive currently available UDAG fund, funding. This list is in turn reviewed by the Assistant Secretary for Community Planning and Development. Ultimately, the Secretary of HUD presides at a meeting with the UDAG office personnel, the Assistant Secretary, and other senior HUD officials to make final determinations. Regional HUD directors do not, and he underlined the word not, play a central role in the selection of UDAG eligible projects or in the awarding of grants, although they may voice their opinion on a project's worthiness. Let me just continue a little further. Throughout this review process, two important sets of criteria define a project's eligibility and preference for UDAG funding. First, the city or county must qualify as a UDAG eligible area based on certain criteria, such as the overall level of economic distress in the area. Second, the specific project is rated against other eligible projects based on the number of jobs likely to be created by the project and the ratio of public to private dollars. A project is more attractive if a limited number of public dollars leverages a significant investment of private dollars. The Fort Worth project, which involved the creation of low and moderate income housing, met all the relevant criteria. And then let me just read this last thing. In any event, Mr. Wilson never urged the awarding of a grant to the Fort Worth project, but rather asked the UDAG office to give the project a full and fair he hearing. Um, you know, it goes on, but I'd be interested to have both of you comment on what you, m Mr. Uh, Lance Wilson has said. I believe what he said there parallels what I was saying, and that the ultimate decision is in the Secretary's office. You do have the different criteria there. In this particular case, the bare minimum threshold criteria, if I'm remembering correctly, was what was met. Uh, the most ideal type of a UDAG would be for a uh, hotel with banquet and convention facilities which will generate approximately one permanent full-time job after the completion of the structure for each room in the facility, i.e. a thousand room hotel will have about a thousand full-time permanent jobs. The multifamily industry, and I believe I can speak rather clearly on that, I serve as a director on the national and the state and our local apartment associations and have been in the apartment business for 20 years. At most, you're going to generate four or five full-time jobs per hundred units of completed apartments. Therefore, the f cost of federal dollars per full-time job is extremely high in a UDAG involving for rent housing. At a time when there was very little money for such things, at a time when the nation was still recovering from the recession of 82, one has to ask oneself the question, was this the highest and best use of federal dollars to spend several million, seven million of them to perhaps generate 40 full-time jobs? Uh, as Mr. Severe was testifying, the in-house HUD people did not feel that this project was that necessary, that feasible, that all of these different criteria would be would be very difficult to meet them by with this project there is enough subjectivity in almost any decision making process that if you can get one almost there then maybe you can say it was there so and you you basically agree to this extent that ultimately that was not your authority which you've said but in terms of meeting the criteria of UDAG grant you feel that your people significantly demonstrated that this just didn't even come close. That was what not only my people, the Washington people felt too. They were overridden by those who outranked them. Okay, so your testimony is that not only your regional people, but uh, people within HUD Washington uh, were against this project as well. Yes, sir. I believe a gentleman named Hugh Allen was the project uh, coordinator or whatever the right word might be on this one and I believe Mr. Allen's recommendation was of disapproval. Thank you Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you very much. Uh, in this same press release issued today by Mr. Wilson's attorney, the statement is made, I quote, Mr. Wilson's role in the awarding of a UDAG mm -hmm. grant to the Fort Worth project was peripheral. Would you view his, uh, his involvement as peripheral, Mr. Udaley? I would say that if Mr. Marion, the CEO of Payne Weber, who was here earlier, were to call their office in Boise, Idaho, and inquire about an account that the people in Boise would think it was a little more than peripheral. <laughs> yes, I, 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 I would, uh, I would uh, have to agree with you. Fairness here, I mean, one is the chairman of the board and one is the chief of staff. There is a difference. I believe Mr. Lantos, in his opening remarks, said that when Mr. Could, could you pull the mic a little Certainly. closer? I said, I believe Mr. Lantos, in his opening remarks, said that when Mr. Wilson spoke, HUD listened. Okay. And, and acted. Yes, sir. Thank you. Just one more. I want to move on to another subject, if I, if I may. One of the most egregious uh, HUD decisions that has come to the attention of uh, this subcommittee in all our hearings relates to Colonial House in Houston. Uh, tell us, uh, Mr. Severe, if you would, uh, what your involvement was uh, my understanding is that you uh, expressed very strong opposition to DRG funding corporations operation there that you tried to stop it uh, but basically you were overruled could you expand on this and give us your full role in this matter yes and could I ask you to pull, pull it a bit closer? Okay. Yes, sir, I first heard of the Colonial House project the latter part of August 1984. Yes. Our HUD manager in Houston, Jim Wilson, called me and told me that uh, the DRG company had been into the office saying that they had underwritten Colonial House and would we'll be coming in within a week or two for us to ensure the project. And Jim mentioned to me that they had talked in terms of a $60 million value with a $47,200,000 mortgage. Yes. And um, being generally familiar with Houston, I agreed with Jim that that seemed outrageous at the time. So I went to Houston, took an appraiser with me and Jim Wilson, some of his staff, and we walked the project, looked at the area, checked the market, and uh, frankly, at the time, in our opinion, we did not do a complete appraisal, but a walkthrough, uh, I thought the project was worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $13 million. $13.13 million? Yes, sir, which would result in a, about an $11 million mortgage. Uh, and, and in fact, DRG claimed that it's worth 60 million. That's and right. We're, we're trying to get, and in fact, did get mm -hmm. a 47 million dollar loan on this. Yes, sir. Uh, so this is not just a question of a slight difference in opinion. I mean, this this so clearly indicates deliberate fraud and misrepresentation mm -hmm. that even in in the HUD swamp it uh, it sort of takes the prize and mm -hmm. what did you do mr. severe when you well, when you confirmed have, this well I I called uh, Maurice Barksdale who was assistant secretary for housing yes. commissioner at the time and Maurice was familiar with that area and was very concerned about it and in fact sent uh, two of his underwriters from Washington to look at the project to see if they could differ with what we thought it would be worth. Uh, I met them in Houston. We visited the project again, and uh, there was really no significant disagreement or any disagreement of any kind. I mean, they, they, they shared your view that the, that, that the facility was worth about $13 million, not $60 million. That's correct. Okay, go ahead. And... Uh, 
I had several telephone conversations with Maurice Barksdale. Uh, he agreed with me, shared the concern of the Houston office and Fort Worth. But the end result, uh, Maurice called me and said that he had had discussions with the general counsel's office in HUD and the secretary's office. And that unfortunately, the ruling is that the department has no choice but to ensure this project. And that we were directed to ensure the project based on, again, a decision that he had received from the general counsel's office and the secretary's office. My response at the time, and I'm not an attorney, but I, I told him that in my opinion, that the department could justify and should justify not ensuring the project as a result of misrepresentation. Misrepresentation, of course, being the value and the mortgage amount. But he said that, again, that uh, the department had reviewed it very carefully, and unfortunately there was no choice, and we were directed to ensure the project, which Jim Wilson did in Houston under direct orders. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. As a matter of fact, when we had the general counsel here, I believe I raised the same issue mm -hmm. when you are confronted with fraud and misrepresentation. He obviously should have, uh, should have indicated that, uh, that HUD is not going to ensure this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, I can't think of a court of law with appropriate appraisals that wouldn't have, uh, mm -hmm. wouldn't have sustained that decision. Uh, you had any involvement with this, uh, sir? No, sir. This happened after the time I left. This uh, happened after yes, the sir. time you left. Congressman Shays. We've had few people here who, <laughs> who have appeared before us who I feel like uh, had the taxpayer's interest at heart, but uh, both of you gentlemen uh, are in that category of a few. And I thank you for uh, having that interest. Um, I, um, I just wish someone had been listening to both of you. I want to be clear that, um, uh, Sibri, when you uh, made a determination that Colonial House was really fraud and misrepresentation, uh, you valued it in the range of 13 million. Um, DRG looked at at it as uh, being up in 60 million and getting a 47 million dollar loan from HUD. When you spoke to Mr. Barksdale, you, your testimony to us is that he said that the council, HUD council said it had to be funded? Yes, sir. What he said was that he had requested that the general counsel's office review this to see if we had to insure it or not. That he told me he was going to do that and then he called me back and said that he had a ruling from the general counsel's office. He did not say, you know, a person in that office specifically, you know, such as the general counsel. He mentioned the general counsel's office and the secretary's office. And, and so, and he also, someone in the secretary's office said it had to be funded as well. Two uh, separate? Apparently. Well, I want, to, I want to strongly commend both of you gentlemen for your outstanding service, uh, in your case, while at HUD, and in your case, Mr. Severe, uh, your continuing service with HUD. Uh, you are still with HUD, is that correct? Yes, sir. Um, you represent uh, the dedicated, honest, serious, hardworking, decent career service and we are very proud of you and very grateful to you. Um, I, I, I simply cannot begin to tell you what pleasure it gives, I'm sure, my colleague Congressman Shays and me uh, to publicly commend uh, individuals who have had uh, a sense of public responsibility and a sense of integrity in, uh, in carrying out their duties and responsibilities. Uh, I want to thank both of you for coming and uh, you, have, uh, you have not only helped this subcommittee in its effort to focus on the real issue, 
which is the provision of affordable housing for tens of millions of American families. I think it's very important to realize that all of these lengthy hearings that on the surface focus with wrongdoings of individuals basically have just one goal and one objective, and that is to see our Department of Housing and Urban Development do the job that it was created to do. That is to facilitate moderate and low-income and middle-income families obtain decent, clean, attractive, affordable housing. And individuals like the two of you uh, are helping us along this line, and the chairman would like to express his appreciation to both of you. Thank you. Congressman Thank you. Shays. I, I don't think I pronounced your name properly. It is Mr. Severe, is that not Severe, correct? Severe, yes. yes. I apologize. <laughs> the least I can do, given all that you've done, is to pronounce your name properly. <laughs> well, I've learned to live with that problem. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I do want to say that uh, I sometimes have gotten almost overwhelmed by uh, how deep and broad the swamp is. And uh, it's, uh, it's just very important to know that there are people that um, don't like the swamp. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anything either of you gentlemen would like to add? Mm, not me, no, sir. No. Thank you, sir. In that case, I want to thank both of you, and this hearing is concluded. Good morning from Washington. Be sure to join us tomorrow for a hearing on expanding the tax deductions for individual retirement accounts. Senator Lloyd Benson chairs the Senate.